Okay, let's start. So today this session is a recorded one. We will talk about uh, a recap and revision on the scars and device you potentially encounter in both short cases as well as in clinical consultation. So this is some disclaimers. Just before we start, it's important for us to know, to know that every scar tells a patient's story and teaches to become a better clinician. So photos that are used in this uh, session is only meant for educational purpose. It includes online resources like past tests, as well as real patients who have already given consent for the sharing purpose. Okay, Please do not share the photos in this slide for personal or financial gain. So these are all potential encounters be it in abdomen, respiratory, cardio, neuro, or even in clinical consultation. So first down with abdomen. So these are all the possible scars that we can uh, appreciate during the exam. Start off with the top to the bottom. So here we can see that we have a rooftop scar. So it's mainly due for, uh, for a lot of procedure. And we've also got a midline laparotomy, which is a, a supra-umbilical and also infra-umbilical. And there's also paramedian scar, as well as epidectomy uh, scar okay you can also see there is a uh, nephrectomy scar sometimes as well as a lower uh, incision and you can also see this is a table okay so to simplify it we can divide the abdomen into hepatobiliary renal or hemato okay so let's start with the hepatobiliary so you can see that this is a rooftop or what we call a chevron scar and this is a modified form of rooftop scar. Both actually means the same thing. And there's also a third newer form of scar we call it uh, modified Makuchi incision. Basically these are all considered as the same rooftop scar. Okay, You can see that either this is a Y like a Mercedes-Benz scar or buckle handle rooftop or you are you are having this Makuchi incision. Okay, So what are the indications for rooftop scar? So it signifies for maybe something is being taken out or being implanted in. So if it's being implanted, it will be liver transplant. Taken out will be hepatectomy or any form of pancreatic surgery. Sometimes in the patient with a triple A repair, they can also uh, use this uh, approach. So this is the uh, another form of scar. You can see that there is a reverse Makuchi incision. And what's the thing that is different is you, you see one stoma back here and there is infra umbilical midline laparotomy scar and there's also one scar here okay so what would be the your your working diagnosis for this patient okay so first of all we, when we talk about uh, modified Makuchi incision we have to think about liver transplant and if this patient have a liver transplant what might be the possible etiology we know that in paces the commonest one is actually still being uh, what we call as palmibiris uh, choryngitis, especially with the stoma, which may suggest some inflammatory bowel disease. And the association disease that can potentially uh, cause liver transplant is the ulcerative colitis. So you can see that in a modified Makuchi incision, there is possibility of removal of the gallbladder, removal of the liver, or, or transplanting a liver. Okay, And this infra umbilical midline lapotomy can be due to a few things. It can be due to colectomy. And if the colectomy was done, it can tally with the diversion illostomy that's put in. Okay, possible total colectomy. So the working analysis for this patient on inspection alone, you will you will think that maybe this patient have an end stage liver disease with uh, liver transplant, underwent a total colectomy with a diversion illostomy. The unified diagnosis will be due to ulcerative colitis with primary sclerogen cholangitis. Okay. How about this patient? Does he looks a bit pale, that's why you see the skin is quite fair. But if you look closer, there's actually one uh, transverse uh, scar over here. And the stem was presented with lethargy and please examine the patient's abdomen. So this is actually tough if you don't see the scar properly. You can see the scar here and here and also here. Okay, So the kidney is not palatable, liver and spleen is not palpable. So maybe you're dealing with more like hematological condition. So to describe further, you can see that there's a scar here here, here, and here, okay? So upper transverse incision may suggest a splenectomy because of location. And this thing, this triangle shape is usually the lapar uh, laparoscopic approach can mean, signifies the removal of something in the pathology at the right upper quadrant. Most likely it can be due to cholecystectomy, okay? So the unified diagnosis may be some form of chronic hemolytic disease that require both removal of gallbladder as well as a spleen. 
So it can be due to, for example, thalassemia, hereditary spirocytosis, or even sickle cell anemia. How about uh, when we go into renal abdomen? You can see that renal abdomen is always the case that a lot of scar to appreciate. You can see there's multiple neck scar, possible suggestion of tunnel calf catheter in the past, and this is maybe the fistula. And there's also one transverse incision with the previous tank cough. Okay, so you can also see this picture from all, all the previous OIJC, and this is a tunnel catheter and the current catheter. So it's important for us to appreciate that whether you are dealing with transcutaneous tunnel catheter or you're dealing with fistula. Okay, so now I go to the tank cough catheter. <clears throat> So you see that tank cough catheter, uh, if you are observed in OT or even any patient with peritone dialysis, you understand that actually they will have a U thing, U setup. And most of the time, the acid site we appreciate at the lateral aspect of the umbilicus is actually the acid site. But the, there is something hidden within the skin before they go into the peritoneum. Okay, So it's usually is, is a form of U shape. Okay, So there is this vertical incision site, sometimes maybe smaller, to put in the tank cough form. The subcutaneous into the peritoneum. Okay, subsequently there's one jumping site. Sometimes may or may not have the scar here to to actually uh, form a U. So this is a jumping site. Okay, and then subsequently the acid site. Okay, from the acid site the tank of catheter will exit out from the skin from the subcutaneous tissue outside to the skin outside. Okay, so this is the set out, and you can see that this patient most likely have a Rutherford Morrison's uh, incision over the right uh, iliac region, and you can see some parambical, uh, perhaps it's an infra umbilical in, uh, vertical incision, as well as there's also a uh, transverse incision over the near the finestal incision. And there is something here, okay? This is a tank of catheter, so you can see that maybe this is actually the, the incision site, and this is a jumping site. So maybe under endology, you would mention that this patient have uh, active mode of dialysis of peritoneal dialysis as evidenced by the tank of catheter and perhaps he already have a failed uh, right renal transplant. So this is just some diagram that I learned from my uh, nephro trainee back, back to the time when I was still a uh, very young uh, and junior medical officer. You can see that usually the cuff for the tank of usually takes about 4 cm opening to put in from the subcutaneous into the peritoneum. It's about 4 cm. And then here we form a jumping site. Sometimes a jumping site, they may use an incision to open it to make sure that there is a form a inverted U shape properly and then followed by the acid site, about 0 0.5 cm. So this is a typical sec alternative in which there's no jumping site uh, scar is done. They just uh, intraoperatively put in and then uh, make it travel back to the outside. Okay. So perhaps the diagnosis for this patient will be tank, uh, is a tank of catheter active mode of dialysis, uh, renal replacement therapy with a right failed renal transplant. So you can see that there's different uh, uh, forms of uh, Rutherford Morrison scar that can suggest transplant. Sometimes the scar can be quite faint here and here. You can see there's also a midline laparotomy scar for this patient. So next is an open nephrectomy. So this is a very barbaric kind of scar, right? Because uh, Open nephrectomy often require a very large incision in the past. But bear in mind that nowadays, the scar for nephrectomy tends to be very small because it's done through the laparoscopic approach. So want to reduce the length of stay of hospital infection uh, as well as reduce the pain. So you can see that there's one scar here, here, and also here. Generally, how they remove the kidney after they use the laparoscopic approach is usually they will put a vertical, uh, sorry, transverse incision like a finasteal incision very very near the uh, the bladder region, very low down so that it won't affect cosmetically. Okay, you can see that this is usually the site to withdraw the 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 trans uh the nephrectomy uh the kidney the native kidney that's removed. So this is again a Rutherford Morrison scar over the right side here and here. This patient have a double lung uh double kidney transplant, and also double nephrectomy was done. Okay, so in a patient with vital nephrectomy and evidence of renal replacement therapy, you may want to offer the etiology to be something that's big enough to remove, or maybe it's not big enough, but it's cancerous, cannot stay in the body for too long, even if it's remained as a native non-functioning kidney. So when you think about something like renal ca cancer, and renal cell carcinoma is common with the association of one hippolyndal 
or bilateral renal tumor. Or sometimes in the patient, although the kidney is not functioning, but it's causing issues like resistant refractory hypertension, nephrogenic. It's also indicated for removal. Adult polycystic kidney too big, too too huge. That's why it's uh, also indicated for removal. Or sometimes even if the native non-functioning kidney is causing uh, recurrent infection of the urine tract, we call it recalcitrant UTI, and may cause actually by the obstructive uropathy and it, that can even impact the transmitted kidney function. So those are the possibility that if you see this by uh, renal transplant scar as well as bite nephrectomy, this will be your working diagnosis. Okay. Next thing is uh, on top of the uh, renal transplant and also the PD as well as HD, it's important for us to know that any patient that underwent renal replacement therapy may indicated for parathyroidectomy at some point of time. Okay, so you can see that there's this transverse incision, okay, over the uh, neck, okay, and you can see that there's also a fistula here and here, and this is actually the auto implantation of the bicep muscle instead of deltoid, and there's multiple scar over here. This patient is very complex. If you come up for exam, don't be panic. Just uh, try to analyze the scar one by one. So to highlight that, this patient has multiple scar. You can see here, here, here. I highlighted in. I put the markers in different colors so to explain it easy. So this is most likely the root Fort Morrison scar to suggest right renal transplant. And you can see that this is like the triangle, right? So it may suggest a uh, laparoscopic nephrectomy. Here is also possible like laparoscopic nephrectomy over the uh, left kidney. This may be light kidney. This one may be previous some um, tank cough, you see. Now you see, right? This is actually the incision site for the tank off, jumping side, and also the exit side, okay? So this one may be, may be related to the uh, tank off. Or this side, this quite near to inguinal ligament can also be some form of inguinal lymph node biopsy. We are not sure, okay? How about here? This can be due to um, the nephrectomy like I mentioned. And this one may be due to uh, some possibility of uh, appendicitis uh, causing appendicectomy. And this one can be due to the graft native biopsy of the uh, graft biopsy for the transplant kidney or sometimes can be due to post-operative drain. No? So you can see that yes, this is a parathyroidectomy scar. This one is a field fistula because patient you feel that there's no thrill and blue is laparoscopic nephrect. Right, red is the right nephrect as well. Yellow is previous tank of removal. The orange is possible inguinal lino biopsy. Then this one is uh, faint green line. Okay, we suggest the uh, graft biopsy, pink may be due to lens incision, uh, and also the Rudolfort Morrison scar to suggest right renal transplant. Complex, but if you try to explain and if you know the distribution of the scar, it won't it won't be uh, difficult for you. So this diagram is actually taken. This photo is taken from the past test. You can see that there is midline sternotomy scar. There's also midline uh, laparotomy scar, and there is also a a vertical incision, paraumbilical incision, and what else you can see? Okay, there's also a Rudolfort Morrison scar over here. So what what are the possible diagnoses? Let's interpret one by one. A total of four scar like I mentioned. Okay, so what are the pot, uh, possible procedure that was done to explain the underlying diagnosis? So you can see that. Let me just yeah okay. So you can see that there's no stigmata of chronic liver disease and the kidney are not palatable. And there's also no signs of uh, any form of hemodialysis in this patient. No tank of uh, active tank of catheter. There's no IJ scar over the neck. There's no fistula. But there's also no stigmata of chronic liver as well as chronic, uh, 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 chronic hematological disease. So let's dissect one by one. The clue is the Rutherford Morrison scar, what we call hockey river stick scar, is very suggestive of right renal transplant, right? This is something, it's a hard sign, okay? So we agree that the patient have a right renal transplant scar. So most likely you're dealing with um, you're dealing with renal abdomen. Second thing is this paramedian scar. If you think this is a renal abdomen, then most likely this one can be due to tank off removal for the previous uh, parental dialysis. And patient may have a CABG done. And however, you cannot uh, the CABG can also exp uh, the midline stotomy can explain CABG at the same time can also explain the valve replacement from some underlying disease that associated with liver and also the heart condition. We are not sure at this point of time. And this midline laparotomy scar, indication can be a lot. Something is taken out, something is taken in, or being taken out and, and put in at the same time. So we are not sure. <clears throat> so we need to know that 
this kind of case has actually come out in UK, not in Malaysia yet. But let's go through them for learning purpose. So most likely, we all the things that we, we we have, we can say that patient is actually having end stage renal failure, uh, on uh, active mode of renal replacement therapy via the right renal transplant, and the past one is maybe due to the previous, uh, peritoneal dialysis. So what are the primary disease for this patient? It can be due to adult polycystic kidney disease because there's no palatable kidney, but there's a possibility that the kidney is being removed through the midline laparotomy scar, or it can be due to united enlargement of the uh, autosomal recessive kidney. And this one may be due to some form of mitral valve repair, right? In mitral valve prolapse in association with adult polycystic kidney disease. How about second possibility is diabetic nephropathy, which is more common cause of end stage renal failure. And patient can have a CABG done because of the vascular uh, risk factor. And DM is also very uh, important that can cause kidney to fail and subsequently patient went through renal transplant as well as then cough catheter. Okay. So let's say but how to correlate the diabetic nephropathy in relation to midline laparotomy. So we always try to explain things in single etiology. In UK, there's a possibility that what we call a simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant, in which patient the selection criteria is usually type 1 diabetes meritus, in which they can transplant both the pancreas and the kidney, okay, at a different region of the abdomen. And the, the idea of doing this is actually you can cure the diabetic mellitus type 1. Huh? Okay, so how to do that is actually the midline laparotomy can be used to do a surgery to actually uh, transplant a pancreas into other two locations. It can be either into the uh, ileum or it can connect to the uh, urinary bladder. Okay, we can talk a bit later. But let's conclude with our, our actual diagnosis in this patient. He has an end-stage renal failure requiring RRT with an active mode, which is a right transplanted kidney, and the previous mode of renal replacement therapy is most likely peritoneal dialysis. The primary cause is due to end-stage secondary to diabetic nephropathy, and also have a midline stodomy scar which suggesting a possibility of simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant. Given the opportunity, you want to look for graft dysfunction and to assess the volume status. So these are the two types of uh, SPK that I mentioned. Pancreas can be attached to the ileum, which is a conventional, uh, sorry, can be attached to the ileum or it can be attached to the bladder. Bladder is the conventional way they can use the urinary lipase to monitor for signs of rejection in terms of the graft or the pancreas. But they said that also cause high risk of infection and that can actually lead to reflux pancreatitis. So nowadays, the more common one is actually to transplant into the ileum. Okay, general principle is you transplant a uh, kidney at one side and the pancreas at the another side, not at the same side. Okay, how about this one? You can see there's only three scar at the back of the abdomen. So this actually can signify laparoscopic adrenectomy. Okay, and this is a patient that we see in clinic. She has given us consent. She has a Nelson syndrome. You can see that all the skin is actually very dark. She showed me her IC. She was a pretty lady before she become uh, sudden, uh, progressively become darkening until now. So what you can see that in Nelson syndrome, they usually have a Cushing's uh, disease in which there's a pituitary microadenoma. So in the olden days, the management for pituitary adenoma uh, causing Cushing disease is to do bilateral adrenectomy. You can see that there's some scar here to suggest laparoscopic bilateral adrenectomy. So after the bilateral adrenectomy was done, what happened was because of no, uh, no adrenal gland left, the, the pituitary can go into a hyperfunction state and therefore enlarge. And if it enlarges, it will actually lead to excessive production of the MSH and causes uh, a lot of this skin pigmentation. You can see that even the buckle is also hyperpigmented and you can see that it's also a hyperpigmentation over the fingers. Okay, so this is some form of primary adrenal insufficiency. Okay, secondary to Nelson syndrome. How about abdomen? You can see uh, for hepatobiliary, sometimes you may get a pack tube in the patient like this. Okay, either, either there's a buttonhole pack tube or conventional pack tube. So this signifies some form of obstruction or some form of uh, dependence in terms of uh, mobility, cannot move. Like for example, those patients that come to hospital because of uh, motor neuron disease, disabling disease, advanced Parkinson disease, those are the possibility. But if let's say patient have in the abdominal station, you hardly see a patient is on pack tube. If the patient is on pack tube, you may want to think about causes like cystic fibrosis patient. 
with the liver cirrhosis and very bed bound, unable to ambulate well. They may, they may come for exam, but generally quite rare. Now we go to the respiratory system. Respiratory, basically you're talking about midline sternotomy, uh, lateral thoracotomy, and maybe there is some form of uh, pacemaker scar, or even some form of mini laparotomy scar, uh, mini tolacotomy scar, and friendly nerve scar and also mediastonoscopy scar is, tends to be quite rare nowadays. Mediastonoscopy scar usually used to uh, uh, biopsy the mediastinal limb node, but nowadays with the advancement of EBUS, endobronchial ultrasound and biopsy, it's actually the, most people doesn't need to go through the mediastonoscopy. Okay? But the, the friendly nerve cache and also thoracoscopy scar nowadays are very rare. Those are for very old TB patients. Sometimes you may have some radiation tattoo. Sometimes in the advanced lung cancer, you may also see some fentanyl patch. And these are the what scar, the triangle-shaped scar. Okay. So this is a typical lateral uh, thoracotomy scar, posterior laterally, here and here. You can see there's some chest twin scar, and maybe there is also some previous chest tube scar. So this is again a photo taken from the past test video. You can see that uh, this is a what scar. Okay, how do we know it's what scar is usually like this? Usually they have a three assess spot. One is for thoracoscope assess, one is for instrumental assess, and one is for utility. So usually in different length serve different purpose, but they can interchange each other. But general principles you will see a triangle. Okay. So what are the indications for what's and urinary thoracotomy? So it's, it's important for us to know what are the possible differential diagnoses. So for the smallest to the more in, most invasive one, smallest can be due to lung can, uh, biopsy, rich resection, segmentectomy, or biopsy or storytelling lung nodule, decortication from the abscess, bolectomy, uh, lobectomy in the early stage non-squamous lung cell cancer, sorry, non-small cell lung cancer, pyrectomy, recurrent pneumothorax, or like pyrodesis. Neumatical thoracotomy, again, you go back to the smallest uh, possibility, for example, decortication, bolectomy, lobectomy, or pneumonectomy, which is very common that come out in the exam. Lung volume reduction surgery in advanced COPD, and also some pyrectomy. And bear in mind that urinary thoracotomy can be due to lung transplant, urinary lung transplant. Okay, so these are the clamshell incision scar that typically suggestive of bilateral lung transplant. Sometimes they may or may not have some tracheostomy scar, as well as some chest twin scar. So again, this patient has a chest twin scar and lateral to the left thoracotomy scar and midline. So sometimes midline thoracotomy scar can also be used for bilateral lung transplant other than a typical clamshell scar. So this is a medial sternoscopy scar. It's a horizontal scar, one cm above the sternal notch, easily mistaken for tracheostomy scar. Usually used for mediastinal limb adenopathy biopsy to, to actually diagnose uh, sarcoidosis, TB or lymphoma. Okay, so this is a tracheostomy scar which is situated actually higher up. Okay, so <clears throat> this patient also has tracheostomy scar. You can see that she has a standard nose deformity and also caudiflower kind of pattern of the ear loops, which is inflamed eh? because of chronic inflammation leads to this caudifier like. So this patient actually have a relapsing polychondritis, but it won't come out in the exam. So it's also important for us to get familiarized with the devices, inhalers in the respiratory system. So there's multiple and variable inhalers that's available in the market. Okay, only these two are spacer compatible, the, the pressurized uh, MDI or respi mark. The rest cannot be compatible with the spacer. So this is aerobica, typically used for uh, for diagnosis of uh, uh, usually for rehabilitation purpose like bronchiectasis patients. Sometimes you can have the acapella. Okay, so this they provide what we call as OPEP which is the oxidatively positive expiratory pressure to try to recruit the lung and open up. It's a form of rehabilitation to actually thin out and also prevent the mucosal plugging. Okay, these are the Okambi, which is the combination therapy or even Trikafta, which is if you're going for an uh, exam in UK, these are the advanced what you call as CFTR modulators therapy in cystic fibrosis patient. Okay, so trichoscopic scar nowadays are very rare. Phenic nerve crash is also very rare. Now we go to cardiology. Cardiology, don't miss the pacemaker or cardiac implantable device scar. You will usually will have some form of milastotomy scar, lateral thoracotomy scar. Okay, so can milastotomy can suggest congenital heart repair, can suggest valvular valve replacement, or can suggest uh, CABG. 
Okay, lateral thoracotomy scar indicates more thing. For example, congenital heart uh, putting in a BT shunt, and supracranial usually suggests an implantable cardiac device. If you're not sure whether this is pacemaker, ICD, or CRT, just mention cardiac implantable devices. Okay, so this is a young child. He has a uh, right uh, thoracotomy uh, scar, and you can see that he is a bit sinus. And you feel, uh, if you look further, he also have grabbing. And there is absent radio pulse. There is a right lateral thoracotomy scar, like I mentioned. And if you put your stethoscope over this area, you will hear a systolic flow murmur. So what is the diagnosis for this patient? Club and sinus means congenital synotic heart. And this may suggest a BD shunt scar, which is a, um, uh, what we call as a shunt uh, surgery. So most likely what patient may have is actually uh, commonest cause is surgery, TOF, okay? TOF with a BD shunt scar. Okay, of course, of course there's uh, other synotic congenital heart, for example, uh, transposition of great vessel of the disease, okay, for example, TAPVD and other things like tricuspic atresia, okay. So this patient have a significant drumstick clubbing, both upper limb and lower limb, and you can see that there is central cyanosis, the lips are actually very purplish, most likely suggest a secondary polycythemia, and Therefore, the diagnosis for this patient, if you encounter club and cyanose patient, your diagnosis, you should offer these two. Whether it's a corrected TOF or any underlying synotic congenital heart, or this can be due to isomangial syndrome from uncorrected uh, uh, right to left shunt, which is, can be due to PDA, VSD, or, or ASD. This is again lateral thoracotomy scar. So, can suggest what are the possibility In cardiology station, you're thinking about BT shunt, can be due to coarctation repair, can be due to pulmonary artery bending, okay? Can be due to VSD repair and mitral valvotomy. So these are the possibility for a repair congenital heart in which there's no midnight stenotomy, but there is a lateral thoracotomy scar. Okay. How about if you encounter a bilateral uh, thoracotomy scar with a midline sternotomy scar? So there's two possibilities I can think of in cardiology station. First is actually a bilateral BT shunt with a TOF, which is commonest. That come out in exam. Of, of course, other than TOF can also be due to other form of synotic congenital heart. And the second possibility is if this patient has mafanoid feature, it can be due to the bilateral thoracotomy scar can be due to bullectomy from recurrent pneumothorax. And this midnight stenotomy scar can be due to mitral valve repair for like for example mitral valve prolapse. Or it can also be due to aortic regurgitation for muffin and underwent uh, mechanical valve surgery. Okay. So this is a patient with a muffin syndrome. You can see midline stenotomy scar, multiple chest strain, really, really a lot of chest strain scar. Pity him to go through all the surgery. And he also got bilateral thoracotomy scar. Okay, so this is suggestive of previous uh, mitral aortic valve replacement as well as bilateral uh, bullectomy okay, in a muffin syndrome. Okay, so next is actually sufferness harvesting. Nowadays, uh, in UK or in, in advanced center, they, they tend to uh, harvest the saphenous vein uh, through going through the endoscopic approach other than open approach. So you can see that if endoscopic approach can be so small in the scar, you may not get a typical open saphenous vein harvesting scar like this. But So it's important for us to encounter to see if let's say patient have any midline stenotomy scar, we should check for any saphenous vein harvesting. But having said that, if patient have underwent CAVG, doesn't mean that patient will not have a valve replacement. So it's important for you to listen for any clicks. So this is a midline stenotomy scar. What are the other what are the possibility when you encounter this kind of patient? For cardiovascular system can be due to CAVG with or without uh, harvesting scar. Sometimes the uh, internal uh, mammary artery uh, they can use for harvest so you won't see any saphenous vein harvest. And it can also be due to congenital heart repair or valvular replacement. Valvular replacement you can always think about can it be isolated or combined? This is a AVR, MVR, or this is a DVR. Or sometimes it can be due to tricuspic valve repair as well com in combination of DVR. So it can be due to TVR. Non-cardio causes can be due to thymectomy in neuro. In recipe, it can be due to emergency lobectomy. Let's say patients have massive hemolysis from bronchiectasis. Okay? So nowadays, uh, the advancement of surgery, cardiothoracic colleague can do something what we call a minimally invasive surgery in which the scar is very small, you can see that they can actually, what they try to do is actually, they in the OT, they will uh, ask 
and has to do a single lung ventilation, intubate the right the left side of the lung, and they induce pneumothorax over the right lung. So this pneumothorax will give space to the heart for the access. So even this patient actually underwent a mitral valve uh, replacement, but because the the right lung is being collapsed, and it gives the access to do a mitral valve surgery, even though the scar is actually at the far right end. So you can see that this MIS is something new that we need to be aware. Okay. So nowadays you can see that MIS can also used to, to do a bypass surgery nowadays, very advanced. You can see that bypass surgery can be done here or even here. And this is all the minimally invasive approach. So how about this scar? Okay, this is usually implantable cardiac device scar. It can signify uh, three things. It can signify ICD, pacemaker or CRT. Okay. And these are some different devices. And nowadays you, you can even have a micro pacemaker uh, device in which can be implanted transcatheterally, there won't be any scar anymore and it will anchor at the level of the uh, right ventricular wall uh, under the II guidance. Okay. So let's how about this? You can see there's some rods here, right? Something something like a rod at the anterior chest at the fourth intercostal space. What is this? This is what we call as implantable loop recorder. Quite very seen, but if, if the patient have this, you should mention when you feel for the palpation. It's usually uh, inserted to investigate for the cause of unexplained syncope. So it can be very small, okay? And amazing, the battery can actually last up to three years, okay? So sometimes when we are busy ex uh, examining a patient, we miss something that the patient wear. If the patient had a medic, medic alert bracelet, no? And they are wearing that, and examiner decided that okay, we want to test whether the candidate able to detect this. They will still ask patient to wear, no need to take off. If you miss this, then you will miss the answer. Huh? Sometimes the medic alert bracelet can be so easy. You can see that you mentioned that the patients have aortic valve placement on warfarin, and you may also want to ask for any uh, INA book record in this kind of patient. Okay, don't miss the device sometimes when they wear the, the necklace. Okay, for neuro. We have gone through a lot in the previous session for neuro, but the idea is to read the stem and mind your step. Okay, mind like I mentioned, check for any muscle wasting, differentiate whether both proximal or distal are involved or just predominantly proximal or distal. Eye is involuntary movement, check for any fascication or tremor, neocutaneous stigmata, deformity can be scar, joint, limbs, and spine. Uh, my focus today is more to scar. Scar can be uh, involving the muscle, nerve, or tendon. Okay, so you can see that there's three patients here. This is like what we discussed previously, looks like asymmetrical, but both are actually involved muscle, severe muscle wasting and shortening and also bilateral foot drop. Okay, so this is an old polio with bilateral foot drop. Both proximal and distal muscle are wasted. How about this? You can see that the distal are more wasted compared to proximal. Okay, and the distal muscle of the hand as well as the leg is also wasted and there's a pass cables, inverted chamfer bottle sign. So this is a more to distal muscle wasting and there's also high arch foot. As well as if you ask patient to walk, you may appreciate that there is a high stepage gate. So this is chocolate marrow tooth disease. Okay, and one possibility is the like this. You can see that proximal muscle are more wasted as compared to the distal muscle. So you can also see when you ask patient to lift up the shoulder. Okay, you can see maybe there is a scapular meaning. So proximal involved more than distal. This kind of patient is what we call FHSD. FHSD. Okay, so you can see that a patient can have a bilateral muscle wasting proximal or distally or predominant proximal or predominant distal okay so next is the neurology okay uh, some other scar uh, not not scar but rash that you can appreciate let's say the patient have all this uh, rash over the back sun exposed area you can see that there's some purplish scar over the malar eminence and also multiple scar over the multiple rash sorry multiple rash over the uh, prominence so this is actually gotrium papules this is actually the sore sign okay so and there's a heterotrop rash as well. Okay, so this is actually a dermatomyositis in the neural case. So the, they can send this kind of patient for exam for you to appreciate the proximal myopathy. Okay, proximal muscle weakness. So how about this scar? This is a muscle biopsy because you can see that this is a bicep brachii. They biopsy the uh, bicep brachii muscle. And this is the quadricep muscle and this is the biopsy of the muscle. So you can see that the side of the biopsy may suggest the side of the weakness. Meaning to say, most likely these two patients have a proximal muscle weakness. How about this scar? Okay, 
So this guy is actually uh, very large, very huge. It can suggest three things. It can either be due to uh, tendon release scar in the patient that have uh, contractures so that they don't get into, you know, significantly remain, uh, the foot remain uh, those effects. It can also be due to uh, uh, tendin, uh, tendon release surgery, like the arteries tendon. It can also be due to serial nerve biopsy, okay? But this is actually a serial nerve biopsy scar. And you can see that this is the Achilles tendon release of repair scar. Okay, slightly at the back. And you can see the previous one, this is serial nerve, which is nearly situated lateral aspect instead of posterior aspect. Okay. And this is a very famous scar that you need to know. So if if you if you see the patient, uh if you clinically you think the patient has a, a seven nerve lower motor neuron unilateral uh palsy, you should really check the back. Uh, of the ear to look for any post auricular scar which may suggest uh, uh, after the CP angle tumor removal surgery okay this patient I mentioned during the neuro session you can see that there's loss of nasal fold both the frontalis as well as the uh, uh, nasal label fold as well as the frontalis muscle so this is a left nerve motor neuron facial nerve palsy and there is some parotid gland enlargement this is a post operatory must also check for parotid gland to look for any scar. Okay, so the differential diagnosis of parotid mass you can give, for example, benign, chronic sardonylitis, abscess, infection of stone, malignant like my parotid lesion. Okay, and this you can see that this is a Parkinson patient. Remember to check the scar. You can see that there's two vertical incision over the scar, both sides, and there is a pacemaker incision scar like that huh? at the supraclavicular region. So this is actually a deep brain stimulation uh, in the Parkinson patient. How about this? Parkinson patient sometimes they can have advanced therapy like what we call as apomorphine infusion pump. So this is actually apomorphine infusion pump. And in overseas, if patients have packed tube, they can give what we call as carbidopa, levodopa, intestinal gel, LCIG. Okay, but generally it's not available in Malaysia. And also equally important if you encounter any patient as they upper limb or lower limb, you find it's actually spastic uh, paraparesis, you are thinking of a spinal cord lesion. You should check the back for any scar, especially the neck. This is this patient actually have a cervical myopathy done the posterior instrumentation. And this it can be also done anteriorly. That's why it's important for you to check what we call as ACDF or huh? anterior cervical instrumentation. So this patient have a scoliosis done the repair. So you can see the how long the, the incision. So vertical back scar give you some clue. What are the possibilities? It can be due to some other spinal instrumentation. But commonly, it's a scor scorotic corrective surgery. And this patient, other than that, also got positive uh, Steinberg sign. And there is also the upward lens dislocation. You can see that the, the, the if you shine the torchlight to the patient uh, eye, you can see that the focus point of the light is actually below the pupil. Okay, So it means to say that the pupil is actually lower. So it means that the iris and the lens is actually dislocated upwards. So this patient actually have a muffin with scoliosis, huh? post-surgery. Next is actually conventional open spine surgery is open at the back, long incision like what we see. Nowadays, there is also minimally invasive spine surgery, just a very small scar like this, okay? Bear in mind. How about this patient? This patient have uh, left partial itosis on oxygen, appears uh, obese or even cushionoid if you check the back. And there is also midline sternomy scar with vitiligo. Okay, so this patient is important. You can come in and exam. So you need to know that this patient is an MG. You should proceed to check for ocular bulbar fatibility, check for neck fraction extension, examine for proximal myopathy over the shoulder, and examine for any thyroid gland, assess the thyroid status because autoimmune association with MG and thyroid is common, and examine for cushing noid features and end examination by checking the peak flow and rheumatological screening. So this patient is a possible recurrent mycenia gravis post thymectomy and currently is in respiratory distress. Okay, nowadays there's different approach to do a thymectomy. Can be due to trans cervical incision. Midline cervical is a commonness, or even trans cervical with subdivide. Or uh, another one is very rare. Okay, Da Vinci thymectomy incision can be missed if you didn't check the 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 chest properly. So this is. A, you can see that most likely this one is a carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Very near the median nerve. So, right to the carpal tunnel release scar. This one is very near the ulna, right? We know that the elbow, <coughs> this kind of long scar, most likely suggests it some form of ulna release, cubital tunnel scar, okay? Decompressive uh, surgery. Uh, how about this, okay? 
So you can see that there is tendon. This one is a bit complex. You can see multiple scar here and there. Basically, this is a tendon uh, transfer kind of surgery, especially useful for those patients that have chronic foot drop. Huh? Patients that have foot drop, if you transfer the tendon of the Achilles tendon and make sure the patient does not uh, remain plantar flex. Instead, the tendon to, is to pull out the leg, pull out the foot, sorry, and then make sure that the patient is in almost neutral position. Okay, so this is a tendon transfer surgery. And clinical consultation, you may encounter a neck scar can be due to thyroidectomy or parathyroidectomy. Sometimes it's difficult to tell because it's almost the same. Clinical consultation, you may also encounter this kind of pump. So this pump is very specific. It's a desproximin infusion pump in thalassemia patient. Okay. Next is, you also know you check the bedside. Sometimes patient will bring the medication. This is generally the feriprox, which is what we call at the oral deferripon. Okay, so this kind of nowadays the thalassemia patient tends to take on this oral chelation instead of subcutaneous injection. And for example, this is a patient that comes for clinical consultation. You can see some bruises, ecchymosis, uh, very deformed foot as well as the hand. This is what we call arthritis mutilus, right? Very severe telescoping of the fingers, and both joints are involved. Okay, so what are the possibilities when encounter arthritis mutilus? We know that uh, opera hand glass kind of appearance suggesting art psoriatic arthritis but please bear in mind that rheumatoid arthritis is a close friend of psoriatic arthritis they can present almost the same so you can see that this patient is actually have advanced rheumatoid arthritis not psoriatic arthritis but you need to think of these two possibilities next is you can see that the patient have a very uh, uh, very narrow uh, very small angle of the mouth okay and furrow and you can see there's multiple uh, what we call a sand and pepper like skin okay over the hands and also the feet and you can see that probably not very obvious you can see that actually there's a bit of uh, Raynaud phenomenon and this patient one look of it you know that the diagnosis is systemic sclerosis and because of microstomia salt and pepper appearance digital pulp uh, it's also important to appreciate the digital pulp usually the pulp will be atrophic that's why it's a bit sharp or even uh, end, uh, pointed end like that and there's also sclerodectary you know? So this patient has a diffuse scleroderma. How about this patient? This patient is having a neck scar transverse. Okay, so this guy can be few things. Okay, so you need to think about lymph node biopsy being the commonest thing. Okay, I will show you how about uh, those carotid and arthrectomy scar. It can also be almost the same. You can see generally it's a bit long. Carotid and arthrectomy scar is a bit uh, more uh, longer incision, but generally it's over the neck at the lateral aspect. Okay. So the conclusion is the eye cannot see what the mind does not know. So it's important for you all to appreciate that there's multiple scar, and scar in exam tell us something. It tells us the story that the patient is going through, okay, for underlying diseases. Therefore, it's important for us to not only appreciate the scar and also some devices that the patient on or the patient wear, like for example, like the aerobic that we mentioned. So all these are important and they will give us a clue in the exam. But if you don't appreciate all those scars before when you come in and send, you may not be able to, 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 to tell what is the underlying diagnosis. Okay, so therefore, this station I feel is important for everyone to go to. Okay, with that, we're going to end the session today. Thank you for uh, listening.